You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Are you into the big swim bait thing? Like, I was like always thinking, like, I know SB is down, I think, down your way now, and he's into that big stuff, but I is that something you've I ever think tried? I've seen him come around some, too. But no, I'm not into it. Why? I don't. I mean, I've got big swim baits. I've I've got that stuff. I do it when needed. I'm not into it. It's not something I'm going to go sit there and be like, okay, I'm going to dedicate my whole day to throwing a big swim bait. Mm -hmm. No, I'm going to go use it for times that I think it's necessary. Like Smith is a big player for the big swim bait. I, Mm -hmm. I know guys that will go chuck it all day long. I can't do it. I don't know enough spots to do it. I, I don't understand it well enough to do it, but I know where I can throw it and get bit. So once I get a limit for like 15, 16 pounds and know I might be somewhere close to that bottom cut line, a certain time of year, I'll just put this swim bait up the rest of the day and just throw it looking for one, six, seven pounder. Yeah. I mean, I guess I bring that up because you were talking about, you were talking before the show started, whenever we talked about the live scope and like, it's a tool that some people wish was just burnt with fire and some people just use it all the time. And it's like you, you eventually want to learn how to use it and bring it to your toolbox. And I know now like the, at least the glide baits, for example, Carl on should not, why do I call it Chautauqua? <laughs> Lake uh, Chickamauga last year, he did well. And then some Japanese guy, I'm not going to, I'm going to butcher his ass, but he did a James river last year too. He threw a little bit of a glide bait action, like for like one or two fish. Like, so it has a place, which is interesting that no one used to fish. Now they're going to, now they're going to fish it. So it's like holes in your game or, or maybe places of your game that you want to strengthen, I guess, is where I was getting at with that question. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's definitely places for it and I, I understand it and I do use a big glide bait, but I'm not good at like, for example, you're speaking of like Carl, I'm not good like him or even like uh Millican fishing. Who's unbelievable with the freaking glide bait. Channel. Yeah. And that live scope, um, no, I don't, uh, yeah, it's a technique I would love to learn, but out this way, I don't know, you know, like, I I guess it's something you just got to learn out this way. Um, I do use a big glide bait though, and it's only for practice because a lot of times I won't get bit, but at least I, I, it shows me where a lot of big fish are in an area. It's like forward facing sonar in that sense. It really does pull them. The only issue I have with them is if those fish don't relocate back in the area they were at and you just pulled them completely away. I haven't, like, have you had a real problem with that, though? Oh, yeah. Or is that more of an every now and then? Um, it depends on time of year again. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've seen it happen in more places than not, to be honest, but... I don't know. It, it, I guess it's a more of a confidence and personal opinion thing. Those things take a lot of confidence. I would say that like you have to have some either balls or a lot of confidence to be able to like chuck those all day long. And I think that's what hurts with those is if you don't chuck them all day long, you're just not going to have success with them. No, no, one bite not. changes it. No, you're not. And like I said, I've learned the other, not the glide bait, but just a big swim bait. I've learned where I can throw it at certain times and get bit but i'm not somebody that can go catch five six seven fish all day throwing it i don't have that confidence in it Mm -hmm. but i have confidence in it to get a big bite so i'll I'll do that instead just looking for one with it later in the day type deal do you believe in that like i remember growing up you know fishing um high school tournaments and of course with your dad and it's in it like limit then look for bigs versus like having a pattern that just is all big fish centric like what is your philosophy on that it it, to me it depends on like i mean i guess you need a lot of context for the tournament situation you're in but in Um, general i have a general idea of it as it's a time and a place to run either thing Mm. um it all depends on body of water time of year you know, all that stuff. Um, if I'm fishing like a Lake Conroe in March, I'm not going looking for a limit. I'm looking for five big bites all day because that's a place you're going to catch 40 pounds. Like 
not maybe not 40, but you know what I mean, a big mm-hmm. bass. Um, if I'm fishing like a, I don't know, like a Lake Anna in September, yeah, I'm going to go look for a limit for 10, 12 pounds because I know I might have a check. And then I'm going to look for a kicker the rest of the day because if I get that kicker, that's the difference of you getting sixth place or you winning the tournament. Hmm. In like September, you know, like it's somewhere. Potomac River in September, you know how brutal that place is. Some guys will tell you, I'm going to go five bites, you know, all day. But the guy that catches a 10 pound limit usually is getting a check every time in September on Potomac. Yeah. So um, that's kind of my philosophy. It all depends on time of year. Like if I'm fishing a Bugs Island in March or April, I'm not looking for 80 fish, I'm looking for five bites. Yeah, I would also add to me, it also depends on what species we're going after. If we're on a spot heavy lake or a largemouth heavy lake too, like oh, that, would, that would also add a little caveat. And I'm thinking more of like Lake Hartwell, the Kiwi, but I guess, you know, Gaston would be probably thrown in there as well. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll touch base on Gaston here in a little bit. <laughs> and we'll actually touch about that because I actually went for a limit every day. Really? Yes. I didn't go for a big fish thing down there when I was there. That's an interesting mindset because everyone always says if you, if you, any major tournament winner, 90% of the time, they're always like, well, I fished to win or some bullshit like that. And and I think it's so weird when you say that, because I think that's a strategy that more people should do because you become consistent. It's like, you're just trying to like bat for average, get a good limit. Andy Morgan said, I heard him say this in the tournament once. And I really truly like Andy Morgan, a heck of a fisherman. But he said one time you catch 14 pounds all around the country. And I think it was in the television episode on the Potomac River, I think, actually, Hmm. when I think Clark Winlet won that one. He said that um, if you catch 14 pounds every day all around the country, you're going to win a lot of money and possibly some tournaments. That's interesting. Why 14 pounds? Yeah. Okay. I could see that. Dang, 14 pounds. 14 you know, now with live scope coming out, you're looking more at the 15, 16 pound mark that you got to be at. But so you said live scope, and I guess we'll go back to like Gaston. Um, yeah, you fished the Bass Opens, uh, Bassmaster Opens last year. Um, I remember one specific event because uh, I met you down at 81 to pick up a GoPro. Uh, yeah. did, how did you want to? How did you want to tackle them? Did you want to start from like event one and just? go through them super quickly or is there any yeah, highlights we can, you take away? Well, we can do that um the first event um i focused on the five foot the five bites deal james river I, correct? james river i was looking for five bites all day i knew i was going to catch a lot of fish so i tried to throw different things to get the bigger bites because the fish were on beds you know so you're going to catch a lot of males um so i really was trying to work I was trying to actually fish for pre-spawners in that event because I found them in practice pre-spawn. They were big, fat-bellied fish, and I was catching not many, but when I got bit, they were four and a half to five and a half pound class. Um, as the tournament came around, I didn't adjust properly, to be honest. And um, not until late the second day, I realized like I just need to slow down. And that, I know that sounds crazy that late into a tournament. I was just so focused on what I had figured out that I never made the adjustments earlier because i had a camera boat on me all day the first day oh shit so i was like i don't know i guess my mind wasn't there but it's Um, your this was the biggest if i'm not mistaken this is the biggest event of your life right this is your first best open yes and i guess i was just i knew and the thing was the areas i was fishing i knew if i got bit they were going to be big ones and they just disappeared on me um and they didn't really disappear. They were right there the whole time. I just didn't fish for them properly. Um, so late the second day, I went back in that area, slowed down, and caught two four pounders, and my co-angler caught a seven. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the big ones were there. I just didn't slow down early enough. Um, it's actually when he caught the the seven is when I slowed down again and caught the second four pounder. And when you, I guess, when you say slow down, you mean like literally just slow down? Was it, are you talking mentally or physically with Both. your direction? Both. Because I was, I was power fishing. Um, and I caught the first four pounder because I slowed down power fishing. I was still fishing at a fast pace, 
but I was being more thorough with my fishing. Um, and then when he caught that big one, I, I realized I needed to slow, slow down. So I picked up a jig and a shaky head and really started slowing down and I caught another good one. Um, but then that tournament, you know, done and over with, I didn't do good the first day and I really didn't do good the second day. Just had a couple highlights, you know what I mean? But it was your first time in doing this, you know, it yeah. was your break in period. Yep. And, and I think this will be a theme too. And this is more of a hypothesis I have with, with, with being a, prof- trying to go to become a professional angler, whether it's the Bassmaster side or the MLF side, the only way you can learn how to fish multi-day events is to fish multi-day events. And, and yeah. unless you're fishing like the elite 70, or something like that, and, and that allows you to fish those kind of events. I truly believe that it affects the fish behavior when you have that many boats on the water starting on a, a Sunday and you're going from Sunday to Sunday to Saturday. Oh yeah. Well, the thing is about the opens, like leading up, you know, I, next year is not going to be the same. Um, but leading up to this year being the last year that you're allowed to do it is there was guys that I know of a couple guys that spent a whole month at Oneida. That tells you anything. Like, there's guys that were spending months at a time at these bodies of water and just fishing whenever they wanted to, however long they wanted to, for a month to two months, learning every aspect of the body of water. Um, so that, that that really puts a lot of pressure on fish when you got guys doing that. And then the whole week of the tournament, you got the bulk of everybody practicing, like you said, for four or five days, six days. Uh, it puts a lot of pressure on fish. So in that first event, going into it, and then once it was in the book and you're pre- prepping for your next, which would be Oneida, did did your thoughts on practicing change going into that tournament? Like from day one of practice to the end of the event, did you reanalyze anything? Because I'm assuming of how many boats were on the water. Um, You know, I had a mindset going into there. Uh, I'm a guy that likes to get away from boats. So my mindset going into the James was getting to areas I know other guys, um, well, I thought other guys would not press their boats through to get to, you know, type deal. Yeah. Um, no, these guys are ruthless. They'll find everything. Uh, so, you know, but fortunately I did have a couple areas that I found that nobody else found. Um, and so then long story short at Oneida, my thing was kind of the same deal. I was kind of, I, my thought was trying to find the fish coming to me instead of leaving me type deal. Uh, Cause I didn't know how far along in my first time ever going to New York. So I didn't know how far along the fish were, you know, I had a good idea after talking to some people. Um, how much practice did you give yourself for a night? Since this is your first time. Uh, I only practice Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Okay. And a half a day Wednesday and Tuesday we could only practice for a half a day because um like I was in eight foot of water and hit bottom with my boat because the waves are that big. So <laughs> yeah, um, it was, it was a rough day out there, but you know, um, was able to find some stuff that day. Actually, that was my best day of practice, which was the funny thing. I had like 22 pounds that day of large enough and small. Damn. Yeah, it was fun catching them all jerk baiting and stuff. But, um, my goal was to find areas that other guys wasn't fishing or focusing on. And then learn, even if guys were in there, my mindset changed to, because of how many boats, um, my mindset changed to, even if there's boats around you, learn how to do what they're not doing to catch the fish. And that's what I was doing. And don't get me wrong, at night I did crappy too. First day I had like two fish. I should have had a big bag and everyone's the shoulda, coulda, woulda. Um, I lost a couple key fish that first day that cost me, but Second day, I ended up catching the limit, made an adjustment, figured something out in an area of a bunch of boats that nobody else had figured out. And I think I was the only one to have a limit out of that area the second day. That's awesome. Um, so, but it wasn't a big limit. I think it ended up being the smallest limit of the tournament, but it was still a limit. I was happy. Um, but it's a win. I mean, that's the thing too. It like, was a, it was a moral win, and it I it, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. So, um, I would love to go to Oneida again and fish another tournament at the time of year. I got a lot better idea what I'd do. That place is so freaking weird. I mean, just the fact that you're fishing almost like an Okeechobee type fish bowl. Uh, the largemouth don't play there as much as like a Lake Champlain or Cayuga. So you're fishing prim- you know, primarily smallmouth and it's just insanely pressured, insanely oh, yeah. pressured as the tournament moves on. Oh yeah. And 
we had a mayfly hatch going on that week. Oh, wow. So it made it even harder uh, for guys like me who didn't understand the mayfly hatch up there and what to do. Uh, I learned, though, so I know next time uh, the thoughts that I had to try to actually do them because some of them were the right thing to do. Um, and I learned how to throw one of them, you know, the big – I'll just I'll just say it. Uh, what is it, the marabou jigs? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that was a key player up there that week, and I really learned how to throw that. So I'm, next time I'm in that situation, I really I, – I feel more confident with what I'm – you know, what I have to do. Yeah, those things are really weird because I've – I didn't, we, we don't call them marabou jigs. We like, they're just hair jigs, but you just slow roll them here on the upper Potomac or the Shenandoah. Same yeah. thing. And, and yeah, it's just so weird why that works so well, but it does. Oh yeah. Um, you know, and then learning, learning to, uh, Oneida was a big learner to just trust your gut and do what you're comfortable doing. Cause, um, one of the guys I roomed with, he just trusted his gut. He didn't catch, I thought he, I think he got three fish all practice. And uh, tournament ended up catching a limit both days. Wow! So he uh, and he j- he didn't everything he fished he never practiced. So so it's funny because I, I I have I have the two voices and one will be exemplified by uh, I'm gonna say his name Billy Coles. He's a guy on the Smith Mountain and he is 100 percent Brandon Thrift where he has like an Excel spreadsheet. Every rod is just perfectly lined up. He has spot three, four, and five planned. And then you have other people that just roll out of bed, don't practice, and just kind of fish the moment. Um, d- does practice hurt or help? Because to me, I feel like nine times out of ten, it really just screws you up when you're trying to get too dialed in. Um, I'd have to say it all depends on how you practice, uh, I think, is a big player and time of year. Because, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of times a year – Summertime, you can find schools of fish and go right back to them and catch them. You know, wintertime, you can find stretches, fish getting on. You can go throw your jerk bait down, whatever, and catch them. And you can go back and catch them again there because it's areas that they are grouped up and they're staging in, and that's where they're staying at for a little while, you know. But that fall time when they're chasing bait so much and moving a lot, and that springtime where they're trying to get up, do their thing up shallow, and then get back out, they're moving so much. Um for me, I feel summer tournaments and winter tournaments practicing helps. Uh, for the springtime tournaments, unless they're locked on beds, practice only helps me personally understand where they're going to. And then as the weather and days, you know, that's when you just go free fishing and figure it out. It's got to also help, too, if you have a a background knowledge of the body of water that you're on compared oh, to, yeah. to a lake that you've never been to before to like a Lake Anna at this point, you probably know by driving around the lake on game day. All right. This is probably what's happening in April. This is my vibe of what to do. Uh, it, going into these, these tournaments though, it, especially now, cause we're going to get to the, to, to the, uh, the upper Bay. Did you adjust your practice mindset from the James to Oneida to the upper Bay, or did you kind of just try to, apply the same fundamentals each time um i kind of try to play the same fundamentals like the upper bay i knew was going to be a tougher tournament so my goal was just to be able to figure out how to catch a limit that was such a weird um, time to put it too i don't know oh yeah <laughs> and i had an area like and i went pre-practice you know month in advance too up there and i had an area in the sassafras river that had fish i had an area in the elk river that had fish but then the week of practice of the tournament, I found some area, the, those areas in the elk had some fish, and there were some big ones in that mix. Um, and then I had areas of fish on the flats, but there was big groups of fish, and there were like three pounders. So I was like, man, if I can get five of these, I'm going to be doing really good, you know. Like, But uh, the way the moon and the tide and the wind ended up tournament days, uh, a lot of that stuff of mine was just there was too much water. I couldn't the, – the fish never got to where I wanted them to be at. And uh, I'll tell you, one o'clock, it was about one o'clock that afternoon, first day of tournament, I had zero fish. Uh, I broke one off, or I didn't break it off. I straightened the hook out on one that I think was like six and a half in a mat. It was it was a pretty big fish. I just, I don't know how I straightened the hook out on it. But, you know, 80-pound braid, 85-pound braid, whatever it was, and meat stick with a two-ounce weight, just, I was horsing it too much. Uh, um but after that i had no fish 
And uh, about one o'clock, I look over and off in the distance, I see about four or five ducks. I've never fished them, never been over there. The way the wind was blowing and everything, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go over there. I'm going to fish these four or five docks and see what happens. And I think I was doing it like four o'clock that day or something like that. First dock I pull up on, I catch a pound and a half or keeper, put it in the box. Next dock I pull up on, I catch another pound and a half or keeper, put it in the box. Then I jumped off a pound and a half keeper. Two more docks later, I jack a four and a half pounder. I was like, okay. And then I had to go back to weigh-ins at this point. But I noticed something in there when I was in there the first day. There was some eelgrass. And I was like, man, as high as the tide has been in the morning, there was an inside line between riprap and this eelgrass. And I said, as high as that tide's been, I, I guarantee I can catch these fish on that inside grass line. I rolled there first thing that morning the second day. And by 830, I was calling out and had over 11 pounds. Dude, awesome. So, but you know, that was just junk fishing, finding something and finding an area that just kind of lucked into, I guess you could say, or just, I would call it like just you know, calling an audible, like being yeah. able to like get out there on game day and read the defense and make the change. And even my co-angler the second day had a limit. I think he ended up finishing fourth in the tournament. We were just whacking them. And then later in the day, it kind of went away. And we quit getting bit, and I made one more change, and I made two crucial calls later in the day that got me up in the thirty fourth place mark. What is it, so? It sounds like your your mindset or, or something clicked from James day one of practice to the end of the opens in the Chesapeake. Like, what what do you think it is? Because it seems like it's almost your ability just to like to relax and just call those audibles quicker. Um, I think the biggest change is is like. The James River was a slugfest, dude. You had to catch 20 pounds, you know, to even have a shot. <laughs> um, and I'm not good in slugfest tournaments. I'm really not. I mean, there's – I guess I'm one of those guys, the moon and stars and all that don't line up all the time for me. Um, and then with the Oneida one, again, it was a slugfest. You had to catch them. I'm, I'm not good at it. But where Upper Bay was a grind tournament where – you just had to grind it out. And those are tournaments I truly, truly enjoy. Hmm. For some reason, I don't care if I'm not getting many bites. I don't care if it, what it is. Those grinding tournaments were 13, 14 pounds a day, and you might win that tournament. Those are the tournaments I really like. So would you say that's something you're trying to try to work on is the Slugfest tournaments? Or oh, yeah. No, I'm definitely trying to work on it. I'm trying to work on, like, figuring out, like, I know what Kenta Kamara did in that James River tournament to catch those big ones. And I saw it for two weeks going on and I knew I should have went and did it, but I've been burnt doing it so many times that I didn't do it. I was going to bring that up more or less the Japanese angle about this. Cause I talked about that on live stream where it's, it's crazy that you have some of these Japanese anglers coming in there. Is it that he reads it differently because he's not from around here. He doesn't, his mind's not cluttered. Like, um why well, is it he picked up on it i guess I, I i you know i don't know why i guess it's like you said he had no knowledge going into that he just went fishing and he found something that he likes doing and it worked um i will tell you that man is unbelievable uh doc talk for that tournament was that he put a hole in his boat at the james river and said i'm just going to epoxy it and keep rolling and that's what he supposedly did i don't know if it's true that was the that's doc cool. talk that's a cool ass story yeah um, and then he goes to win the tournament. So, yeah, I, I just am fascinated by that. Um, he, there was another guy that fished, it was again that Lake Chickamauga tournament, and he's fished a, a community hole the whole time. And he barely knew a lick of English. And he just, people were stunned that this place held up. It was like, well, the pressure and stuff. And he said, like, well, you know, in our, in our home country, we only have like three oh. lakes. So, yeah. wherever there's fish, you just figure out how to make them bite. And that's such a weird mindset. And then you look at the James tournament, that dude didn't run five hours. No. And it's just, it's interesting that their mindset is like, wherever there's fish, you just figure it out. And yep. that's just, I don't know why we're so messed up in the head where it's like, if we don't get bit within five minutes, we clearly have to burn gas. Yeah, no, no, I, I don't like burning gas. I stay close. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I and see, and I know what he was. I know what was going on up there, and I don't know if he understood what was going on up there, but he understood how to catch the fish. Mm. Um, and I'm sure he did. The man's a great fisherman, you know. Like I'm sure he understood, but I know a shad run was going on, and when a shad run goes on, a lot of times them fish wait 
you know, a lot of times the water's cooler too. So a lot of times them fish wait to get on the beds up there. You know, they're they're in feeding mode the whole time until it's kind of like a shad spawn. Um, so when you have big ones pulling up and a shad spawn going on, you try to fit, you know, bass are trying to pull up the spawn and you got a shad run going on. Mm-hmm. It's just a combination of catching a big bag. Um, I was honestly surprised you didn't see, I mean, yeah, he had like 22 and a 24 or something like that. Surprised you didn't see like a 28 or 29. But you talked yourself out of it. I know. And so that's an interesting like conversation. Why did you, like in your head, what told you no? I guess that's such an interesting thing because you, so you had the winning ideas ish there. Well, see, I had another run going on in a different river and okay. I was doing it in that river that, and that's what a lot of them pre-spawn fish were keyed on gotcha. was that, that run, but it ended in the river. I was in a lot faster than it did the James. Gotcha. Okay. So you were onto the same, the same idea. It was just where it was going down. And see, personally, and this is God honest truth. I figured it was going to end in the James before it ended in the river I was in. Mm, okay. um, and it was opposite from at least this year. I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's always opposite. I don't know. I'm still learning that, but I know what, what I was fishing was a run and I know what was going on up there was a run and a lot of times that's big key to when them swim baits play and all that happens. Does that make you feel better or worse? And so hear me out here. If let's say we'll break it down simpler. Let's say if you're on a shad run pattern, but then the guy, the guy that wins it was doing something completely polar opposite. Do you want to finish that tournament knowing that you were completely polar opposite of what people were doing? Or does it make you feel better? Be like, okay, at least I was in the ballpark of what was going on. Um, it makes me feel better because I did know that was, you know, thank, it makes me also sick to my stomach that I didn't get to it myself. Um, and maybe that's, it's, and it's not even a thing like, dude, where it's like, yeah, I'm sick to my stomach because I understand it and I knew where I could go catch them doing that. Um, but I'm telling you, I have been burnt doing that many times. Mm. And especially over a week time period is when I've been burnt the most. Where the one weekend I freaking smash them, and then the next weekend they're like, "Where'd these fish go?" Um, so I wasn't sure over that whole week if it was going to continue going or if we were at the tail end of it because it had been going on for like two weeks. Because when I drive the ninety five bridge every day, I could see all the John boats up there shad fishing, and you know people up there doing their all like it's like freaking uh, Chickamauxkin Bay up there in the Richmond area when the shad runs going on, everybody's doing their thing, catching catfish, shad, striper, all that fun stuff. Um, so I thought we were getting to the tail end of it and I guess it just didn't happen. Maybe it did happen. Cause I didn't go up there and I know what doc talk was saying, what he was doing. And I know the areas he was going towards that were definitely key areas for that to happen. I, I, I still feel like that's a good takeaway that, that you should feel good that you, at least you're in the same ballpark. I remember we fished, oh God, was I think it was our first national championship on Lake Murray. And, you know, we bombed, but we picked the right area. Like the right, the same, the area that we were fishing, the area of the lake was actually the same area that was one out of, and the top four or five were there. And so what was nice is we we understood that we had to do some refinement, but at least we were in the right area of the lake and we picked that correctly and so i always think about like trying to find mental takeaways that okay well at least if you were in the same ballpark that's good it would be horrible if it was like i was so far i was like on another planet with my decision making it sucks so bad yeah Uh, and that's kind of how i look at each tournament oh yeah and dude i look at it as like you know um the good lord will bless you when it's your time and if it was supposed to be my time running that deal, them fish would have never left or never done what they did up in that other river. And I would have whacked them just as good, you know? So at least I found the right deal. I just didn't find it happening as long as the right deal was happening in other places. Um, Cause I also know a couple other guys was on the same deal in another river down there and their bite went away too. That's it's crazy. Not, did. Yeah, you're right. At that point it is, it's just, it's your time. Yeah. So, um, it just kind of, the way it transitioned, he just found that deal on the right river happening at the right time. I mean, so, I mean, I know you have the James like dialed Pat. So is there any other places that you want to practice on just for fun, just get better at like in the year, like New York ish, if you could make a trip up there? Oh, I definitely want to go to New York and make a couple trips. And, um, 
good thing is uh my lady has some family up there that we can always go visit too you know no i'm just kidding i wouldn't use her for that <laughs> um but no we could uh it's it's fun new york was fun and i think she she went with me and practiced with me mm-hmm. uh she actually caught like a four pound smallie and i'm not a, it was it was fun oh, nice to practice so uh, I think she would love to go again and fish up there as well. So we might make that a trip this year. I'm, I'm not sure yet. Um, trying to figure out some other things first. Yeah. Life happens. <laughs> you you got to get, yeah. uh, you, know, <laughs> you got to organize some things, but I mean, that's the weird thing too. Now that you're in this, you know, trying to, to compete in the opens, you know, in, in your life, I mean, in general, and we'll get into more specifics later on, but there are so many, and this is something I, I bitch about personally that they always go the same places. And then if you're trying to compete in this, it's about organizing your game plan. Like, you know, they're going to hit a tidal river on the East Eastern swing and you know, they're going to go to the St. Lawrence river probably. So that you have to start practicing strategically in the areas that you know, they're going to go. Yes. Oh yeah. You got to start doing stuff like that. And like, um, excuse me. Uh, this year's a little different for this East swing because you know they're not hitting a tidal river on the east coast so shocking i know well that i think has a lot to do and i you know i'm not i mean i'm just gonna say it i'm pretty sure the virginia department of game and inland fishery told them they're not allowed to have any tournaments on the james this year so i'm really want to ask odenkirk about that too and have him on the show because if that's the case good for them because yeah no place... great for them because the place has been yeah. getting beat to death for the past what eight nine years now Oh yeah, easily. Let's see. Last yeah. year was the opens, and then the, and the MLF Pro Circuit. Yep. That's all just, the BFLs go there all the time. It's, which you can't like tell them not to go there. I mean, they're not as big. You know, it's not two hundred, three hundred boat tournaments. Um, but you know, the places like that will go there, and then like all the local tournaments, they always continue to happen. The place has just been getting beat to death. So. And it's a shame because there are like, again, I think Kerr is a great idea um, to go there. I mean, Lord knows, I forget the last time Bass went to Kerr and it's a big ass, like it can hold them. I think it was like the eighties or nineties. It was a while ago. Let's find out when the last one they went there was. I'm pretty sure it was when Randy Blockett was pulling his drain plug out to get under the, I think it was Grassy Creek's bridge. That is a good pull. Yeah. Your yeah. dad probably fished that one. <laughs> nah, I don't think he did. Randy Blockett, that's a good pull. The last time they were there was in 91 and 92. You see, that's unexcusable. Um, yeah, 91 and 92. That was the year I'm pretty sure it was freaking flooded or something. And I think that's when Denny Brower, somebody wanted up in the river. But I don't remember. Don't take me. Don't don't quote me on that. No, I'm actually googling it right now. Um, it's yeah, like, it's been that's been that if ninety two, then that's been what thirty years, almost thirty one. It'll be thirty one years since they've been to Bugs Island. Yep, over thirty years since they've been there. Marty Stone was in that tournament. <laughs> Mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and that's something else too that i really want to get your opinion on because we have to because <laughs> it's how it works what do you think about them going to this new format of you have to fish all of them not just your your division all right this is a touchy subject for certain people certain people are not going to like what i'm going to say and certain people are going to like what i'm saying some people aren't going to like the other half i'm going to say Cause I'm going to touch two subjects about it, like two parts of it. I strongly disliked it at first. And I still, you know, I'm not a fan of it because it eliminates guys like me who can only afford to do three of them. But hear me out. The guys like me that can only afford to do three of them. What if we make the elite series? How the heck are we going to afford to do the whole elite trail? You're not. And then that's when you got guys dropping out halfway through the elites because they can't afford it to do the next tournament and the next tournament and the next tournament. Um, if they're not successful. Um, so with the guys that with them doing it to where guys can afford to do all nine tournaments, that's giving them the security of when the guy that makes the elites makes it, 
at least we know they have the funds to be able to fish this level next. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I I don't like it because out of own, my own personal jealousy, I guess, because uh, I can't afford to do all nine and I can't afford to do all that. But I mean, you're still able to fish three tournaments if you want to and still have a shot at the classic. So you can't be but so mad. Um because then you do, you have the guys that will struggle. They fish three tournaments. They make the elites because they had a good year in three tournaments. And then they can't afford to make the elites. They can't afford to fish all, what is it, 10 tournaments at, I think it's like five grand a tournament. If you can barely afford to fish three of them at 1,800 a tournament, how can you afford to fish 10 of them at five grand? Yeah, my... My opinion has matured a lot where I think the biggest thing from a business perspective is there is a niche in the market that is not there that no one is filling and and you hit the head on it. You either fish a BFL or you fish the Bass Open. You know, th- there's no in-between circuit that you can fish out of. And I think really the 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 NPFL or the National what the heck is the name of it? The National Professional Fishing League. What? Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, the MPFL. Yeah, I think they're trying to fill it, but they're not even, I think, doing a good job. Where You need an in-between circuit, a bridge gap between fishing a BFL level and fishing a Bass Open level where you have an increased purse size, you're fishing a multi-day event, and you can go around through your region of the country. I would um, just wait and see what happens in the future. Well, that is ominous. <laughs> I... I... <laughs> I know some things that may be going down by 2024, but I'm not allowed to say anything. So I won't. So then, so you don't get in trouble then, but so then you agree that there is a, a, a a gap in the marketplace. Yes. And I think you're going to see that come in the next couple of years by one of the three organizations. Why do you think it's taking them so long? Like what? Like, Um, like, because they got to close out the things in the past to get to the future. That is a very Bill Gates type of uh, Elon Musk type of answer. Okay, wow. Yeah, I, I, to that. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, like to me, like that was the, the weirdest thing is the Bass Opens really are. It's for the one percenters. It's for the millionaires that have the money. You either have to be completely set yourself, like a boy ducket type of situation, or you got to have enough sponsors to back you to be able to do that. Period. And simple because you don't make money unless you're like a John Cox or someone crazy like that. They can go actually out there and win them all the time. You're not going to make any money off of it. It's really hard. And that's where you yeah. do need that kind of bridge gap to be able to get your reps in to get to that next level. And I remember it used to be the classic thing with FLW where you'd have guys like Brent Ayler, Jason Christie. You would start on the FLW side. You'd work your way up the ranks, get your name out there, get your sponsorship portfolio set, and then you jump over to the Bass Opens because Bass Opens have legendarily just sucked with their payback, let alone that. like Their, their payback is like atrocious. atrocious. Um, um yeah we need to fill that bridge and i think it's going to happen uh, it's just going to take some time um but there's i mean there's dude, there's so many minds working on this because i think they're trying to do stuff like that um for the anglers like myself who can't afford that level but can i think all in all they're eventually going to get it to like the best way to describe it would be baseball yeah, was, you yeah. have a four A, you have a triple A, you got a two A, and or whatever you know, whatever the A's are, um, and then you got the big the big leagues. So now here's a hot take on my end. I think if you are going to have these leagues set up, you cannot have it where you have people going back and forth. If you are on the Bassmaster circuit, you can't you shouldn't be allowed down to a BFL style level to take money away from a guy coming up and coming. The only reason I say that is like, well, you have to face him uh, eventually. It's like, yeah, but on the same token, if I'm playing college baseball, I am not going to see Albert Pujols come down because he wants a scholarship, you know, yeah. it's about my talent level. And, and I think, I think something has to be done about that eventually just to be able to husband the next generation of anglers. Um, Yes, because if you're doing, I, I agree. Because if you're honestly in in a certain aspect, I agree. Like uh, the way the opens were set up in the past, yeah, no, I, don't, I didn't have any problem with them coming down, none whatsoever. But we're only filling 225 spots for each tournament. Um, 
and you you'll have like now you're going to have like 140 probably to 180 guys signing up for all nine because mm-hmm. I'm sure you'll have the MLF guys coming over to fish the opens that don't want to be a part of what's going on you know in MLF where that's a whole different subject. Um, and I I'm 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 not saying anything bad about what MLF has done, and I'm not saying anything good because I don't know my opinion on it yet. So that's a whole different <laughs> subject. Um, I have enough opinions for both of us. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but I think you you know you can't let the pros come down and fill one of them spots. And, and let's say it's not the Bass Open. Let's just say your hypothetical organization that you created comes i don't think it's the best interest for the longevity of the sport to have a a double a system and then you have pros being able to come in and poach it yeah i i agree if that makes sense i I don't know why just fishing college and going to bfls and then working your way up and just knowing like how important that money would be to you let's say if, if you were able to win it but then somebody just jackpotted it i don't know that's just something like that could be an easy fix all the organizations could do to clean that up yeah you no, know, no, no. You're right. Like, because I know I fished against David Williams and Troy Morrow on Potomac in some BFLs because they wanted to make the regional that was near their home body, their home, you know, their house. Um, so that was interesting seeing them guys show up to a Shenandoah BFL on Potomac. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like people. I wasn't mad. Don't get me wrong. I loved fishing against them because one, them two are true gentlemen. Like, they they are very nice guys. Um. And two, pretty sure I beat them both in those BFL. So it didn't really matter to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, like, it's not their fault. Like, and that's the thing. Yeah. It's like if it's legal, that's fine. That's my issue. It's like that you take it out of their hands. You know? Like, yes. There and it's honestly, I can understand why some of them do it. But yes, I, I understand too. At the same time, like yeah. I don't know. I'm 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 very t- torn between that because I don't mind whatsoever competing against them guys because it makes me a better fisherman competing against them, having to try to beat the guys that have already made it to the best level. So I enjoy it. Like if they kick my tail all over whatever body of water we go to, mm-hmm. by all means, shake their hand, move on. They're great fishermen. Mm-hmm. But I can understand for as a whole group, a whole league. It's probably not best they come down and fish. Yeah, and guys, again, this is just these are also just like my opinions and stuff on this. Where I think if if you're an organization and you want a true sampling of your talent up and coming, having those the separations, you know what any other sport has it, and that's why. Again, it comes back to if you want fishing to be taken more and more seriously as a professional sport, every sports league has these separational criteria to where you don't have college football players playing against high school football players to pad stats or, or what have you. And I think it would make it look better when you know that, okay, I have now outfished this league I'm in because I'm in a, a local club and you go to the next level and you outfish that. And I think in the long run, it would help fishing organizations create a better stock of talent because you'll know immediately when you've, you've reached that next level and you can move on. Um, but but something else I really wanted to get into again was that live scope where, you know, you said you had an epiphany with it on a certain body of water up in New York. And I remember because I was actually growing through our last conversation that happened this time last year. And it was just like your your two day for life, you know, screw forward facing sonar. I, I'm never going off the bank, blah, blah, blah. And now you're like, your thoughts have evolved and matured a little bit, right? Um. Yeah, it's it's not that I truly enjoy it by any means. <laughs> it's truly that I guess the best way to put it in my opinion is you got to have it to compete. Like back before it came out, the guys that were willing to take risks and jump logs and do stuff like that won tournaments. But now that you got guys getting aluminum boats and doing all that stuff and jumping logs and doing all the stuff that I do anyways, um competing against the guys that are offshore to be a better all around fisherman and more consistent fisherman. You got to have, it. you just got to have. it. Yeah. I mean, for Unless you're, John Cox. you're John Cox. That's a whole different story. You can stay beating your boat up and freaking well, John Cox and Keith Poche, but I think oh, John yeah. Cox, 
What Cox does, and I think listening to interviews with him, it's more of a mental thing. If he's not necessarily jumping beaver dams like Poche, he's mentally forcing himself to just fish what he's good at, which is, you know, swim jig, wacky worm, you know, burning bank, always fishing new water. And it's so interesting when he says, like, if I don't have it on my boat, I just eliminate all that water and don't have to worry about it. And if you're always yeah. fishing spawning events or pre spawnish events, like, I, I see his thought process there. Yeah. And the post spawn events that they're fishing, like you can still get way, way, way back in creeks and find fish that are resident fish. Mm-hmm. Um, especially on the body of waters they go to, and then they go to New York when down south you can't really be competitive doing that stuff. So he can go up north and do the same thing and be just as successful. So it shows you that you can still fish shallow. Like, and I get it. Like you, I see where you do need live scope depending or forward facing sonar, depending on the time of year and tournaments that you're fishing, but you can be damn effective if you know how to, and again, and they've also been to these same lakes and that's a whole other thing. Like I've gone on tangents about that. If you go to the same lake, same time of year over 10 years, like these guys. Yeah. But you got to also look at, look at the AOI race, John Cox and Paul and neck and neck until they mm-hmm. this one happened. Where did Cox go? He fell out of the picture, but then Chris Johnson came into the picture and um, Lester, Brandon Lester. All you like, guys were live scoping and doing the stuff up north. I mean, you know, you got to – it's come to the point now, if you're going to compete anywhere anymore these days, you've got to have – in at certain times of year, like I'm not going to go out there and chase fish around with a live scope. Like there's going to be tournaments. I'm going to take it off my boat so I don't damage the transducer type deal. I feel like you have to just so you, I, I, again, you know, I, I got it. I got it right behind me now that I have to install on my boat. I'm going to have it on my boat again. I, I My biggest fear when I'm thinking about practicing is when to take it off both physically and metaphorically. So I don't have to worry about it because you can video game fish so easy and it gets so freaking addicting to try to force that one to bite. Yep. And like telling yourself no. See, that's, I don't know my, if I have self control. My epiphany was a couple weeks ago, I fished with a buddy out of his boat and he had it. And we didn't use it for most of the day, honestly. We, we, we stuck to docks and stayed shallow and had fun. Um, but we so happened to go off of a couple points just to see. And, uh, I was throwing in swim bait and Alabama rig and stuff like that, you know. And just the fact that I was able to – I wasn't sitting there chasing fish. I was finding groups of five or six fish off the ends of these points. I was firing that swim bait A rig like you see everybody doing, and I'd watch how they react. If they followed the bait back to the boat and didn't reposition, I just moved the heck on. I said, screw it. I'm not messing with them. Um if they followed it for a short period of time and didn't bite it, but got back in their little cluster, I had picked up a worm and caught fish. If they followed it and they ate it, they had sat there and I had a blast for a little while. But if they weren't eating it, I wasn't spending time on it. That to me is what no one talks about. It's always the bad stuff of forward facing sonar, but it's the fact that your learning curve is cut almost in half. I remember I was out with a guy down, I think it was like Hunting Run Reservoir, and he had it, and we were panning around, and he couldn't find it. We weren't catching him, so I tied on a, I think it was like the 10-inch mag draft, and I just bombed that thing out there, and all of a sudden, they just shoot straight off the bottom, and then that told me, it's like, all right, well, that's where they're positioned. We switched it up, started dragging stuff, and we smoked them, and so that could have been an extra hour or two in our day where we're fishing that old pattern before we make the change. Within five minutes now, we know, like, okay, this is how they're positioned. We need to make the, the adjustment. And I think that's the power of, of forward-facing sonars, to make those quicker adjustments. Yeah, it's just making the quicker adjustments and being able to line up on stuff better and, you know, doing stuff like that. Um, I do know guys that will go just chase fish and chase fish. And that's where it gets to the point where it's like bed fishing, but without being able to physically see the fish, in my, my opinion. Um, you're going to waste a lot of time doing that. But guys are good at it. Hey, do what you want to do. I'm going to use it to a, as a tool to help me locate and line up and do stuff like that. I'm not going to use it to try to force feed fish. That's, oh, that's, that's me. You say force feed fish, and that's something else. Like, when are the fish going to get turned off? Like, again, I'm thinking eventually fish 
you could fish offshore and most of them were stupid, probably didn't care about you. If everyone has forward facing sonar on their boat, how quickly will these fish shut down when they feel that boat? Because they know that they're going to get picked off left and right. I think you'll see a lot more fish go shallow. And I think I'm starting to see that already with what I do, but, um, but I don't know, you, you know, it's, it's, it's just opening up a new world. It's, mm. it's, it's still something I really don't want on my boat. <laughs> I don't want to use it. To, I'd rather stay shallow, but to get to that next level and compete with them guys, you got to have that stuff now. It's just, it's just become one of those things. Yeah, no, it really has. Um, I mean, what, what do you have on, like, what is your schedule for, for 2023 now? What, what are your plans? What are you, what's your, you know, I guess goals? Uh, I was going to do the opens and I chose not to. Um, I, I wanted to do the opens bad. I really did. Um, it's just not going to fit my life schedule right now. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to fish a fishers of men trail with a good buddy of mine. Um, excuse me. You might've had him on your show, Odie or Rick Folk. Ricky Folk. Yeah. Ricky. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Bass o- yeah. Central Bass Open. Yep. 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 Uh, him and I are going to fish the fishers of men together next year. Um, good deal for fun, you know, and stuff. And then I'm going to fish the Bass Nation. Um, I made the Virginia state team for 2023. So I, or 2022 state team, whatever one you want to call it. Um, so I have to go to Douglas Lake in Tennessee in May. Congrats. Sucks to um, go to that Lake in May, but, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm excited to go there. Cause it actually sounds like it's going to fit my style. Um, the style that I have been growing on more or less. Um, so you know, I'm going to fish that. And then, uh, I'm looking for one more trail to fish. Uh, I think my lady and I might fish a trail out of based out of North Carolina. Um, oh, cool. maybe might not deciding still in the works on that one. Um, just cause they're championships at Lake Gaston in October. And for some reason I have a track record at Lake Gaston in October. So, um, it'd be really fun to do. So we might just do that. And that's about it, really. I might jump in a couple BFLs here on the James River or, you know, down at Bugs Island or something like that. Maybe a couple up on Potomac, just places that are nearby the house. Just kind of taking a year off. Going to get everything that I need to get done in the sponsorship and financial world. And then going for 2024, going to try to do a lot of big things. Have you ever thought about guiding at some point in your life? Uh I do want to guide for crappy and striper. Like be fun. I, I, I mean, I've done some under the table guiding and stuff for crappy and striper. Um, more or less just taking people out, then pay me gas money. Um, type deal. So, I mean, that would help you with your forward facing sonar skills. <laughs> oh yeah. And dude, I trust me. I mean, uh, right now is not a good time, but, once uh once um my situation gets better um <laughs> we're not gonna go into details <laughs> once it gets better um I, if people want to go crappy fishing or whatnot striper fishing hit me up we can go we can go i'll take you out on bugs crappy fishing or anna crappy or striper i will not take you bass fishing don't ask do it's people ask that a lot oh yes big time Big time. how frustrating like well, i don't know what is your mindset with that because part of it is like okay clearly they think you're knowledgeable enough that they want your input but is it also like borders on harassment now um no nah, i don't i don't consider it harassment i just i just i'm straightforward with a lot of people like i fish with a select group of people um because that's just who i am and but bass fishing i uh it's 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 kind of my my side gig, I guess you could call it, or whatever you want to. It's just something that I I, I, I truly take pride in. So if I don't, how do I how do I word this? If I don't feel comfortable enough to take you bass fishing, I'm not going to take you bass fishing type deal. Mm-hmm. Um, but striper and crappy, by all means, I don't give a crap. Come on, we can go catch a hundred crappy, and we can go catch. Double striper. 
Yeah, it's really it's it's hard, and I know like it comes down to ethics and things like that, and, and it's yeah. so interesting. And I've, I've had conversations with all so many people about this, and I think the biggest issue comes down to there's no ethical in baseball. We'll go back to that. You know the rules. The umpire just states the rules of the game. In fishing, I feel like so much of it is unwritten, and I feel like so if there was unwritten, yeah, if there was some way you could make it like not unwritten, but just like, these are the rules. I wonder how much of it would clear that crap up if it was something set in stone. Yeah. But then you get to laws and stuff and people will be like, well, the law says this is not your spot. This is a free public lake. Let me mm -hmm. go fish it, you know, whatever it is what it is. Um, people do it anyways, even when they just see you on spots, you know, certain just people do it, you know, it's, it's not an uncommon thing. Um, you got to kind of approach it like you fish Potomac River for a living because you're going to have people near you. Um, I'm, I'm doing a video of that. I'm actually going to set up a, um, a time lapse camera on the river. Uh, I'm pretty sure you guys will know this would be mad at one, but it's going to be for like 10 hours just to show people like you think your spot is like all secret and shit, but watch after on 10 hour laps on a Saturday, how many people actually fish these areas, generally speaking. And, and oh, then yeah. you realize it's not just the area, it's about how you fished it and your nuance within the area. Yep. But the idea like, well, this is the one dock in the lake no one's ever thought about throwing at. It's like, come on, like that's, it's 2023. It's the pressure people nowadays. Know yeah exactly and i think it limits your mindset as an angler because you can't think past that you don't understand the subtle nuances of the spot versus yeah. the idea that no one's ever seen it before well that's like um gaston when i won the state championship this past fall um there was actually a stretch the first day that i i put on a clinic for like 15 20 minutes and come to find out one of my buddies had already fished up through there already and he didn't, he said he caught some fish, but I don't remember what he caught, but he said he caught some fish. And I heck, when I went up through there, I caught like a four pounder, a three pounder, another three pounder, and then filled out the rest of my limit right through there. So, you know. What's also interesting is you, you basically grew up fishing Lake Anna, but Gaston is like, is synonymous with you almost, especially in the fall, like you said, is that, also because the spotted bass factor too is that play into it at all like why that lake sets up so well for you um i'm a true believer that it does hey, granted this last one i i only wait actually i think when we won the elite 70s i think we only waited in one spot of bass that tournament too really but i only waited in one spot of bass at this last one as well but um the first morning of this we'll just go straight into it um the first morning of that state championship like i was telling you i knew the weights were going to be well i thought the weights were going to be higher because the fish i was catching were pretty good fish and um i heck i i got a picture uh well i guess i don't have it in my phone jesse has it in her phone um but i can get you that picture of in practice i caught a five pound large mouth and a three pound spot on the same crankbait in one cast oh my god um so like i was you know i was around really good quality fish and so i thought the weights were going to be more but i also knew the time of year it's always a grind on gas than that time of year um so i always play like again the late 70s i went spotted bass fishing the first hour two hours every morning um uh, my partner and i did and then um the state championship this past october i went spotted bass fishing for the first hour two hours every morning so it kind of, you know, the spots definitely play a role for me because I know I can go like when I, the, the areas I was fishing this past one, like my, my mindset was I could go down there and catch 10 pounds of spotted bass and just upgrade to 14, 15 pounds and I'd have a shot each day. It didn't pan out that way come tournament time. The spots kind of like trick, like they kind of moved, you know, like spotted bass do, they move. Um, and the first day I ended up catching I think four spotted bass before I left and went largemouth fishing. Uh, one of them happened to be a three pounder. So that one stayed all day. Um, hmm. Or a two and a half pounder or something like that. And uh, later in the day, I, I went largemouth fishing and I just, first spot I pulled up onto, I didn't catch nothing. Second spot, I lost a four pounder. 
very next dock after that, I lost another four pounder. Come to find out, uh, I had beat up a hook a little too much on dock post. Um, and it was bending out on me on those fish. So I switched rods. Uh, I went to a Vexen rod that was a little bit softer and skipped it up. Skipped very ne- uh, Left areas, went to another area. Very next dock, I freaking catch a four pounder. Never lost fish for us the tournament then. And uh, I think I ended up catching a four, a three, another three, and all of them had me wrapped around dock post and like just horsing me, getting me all around everything, throwing eight pound test line. It was not fun, but it worked out. Got them in the boat and uh, ended up with uh, say 13, 14 pounds the first day and sitting in third place. But, you know, losing those two big ones, like I said, I should have had like 18 probably, but should have, could have, would have. But your track record there, and that's what's so interesting, like how some lakes and people just go together. Like, Have you ever fished like Lake Hartwell, the Murray, the Kiwi? Oh, yeah. I've fished Hartwell three times now and three – no. i fished it three times, like three separate weeks that I've been down there. Um, the first time was just fun fishing with my dad practicing for Bassmaster Classic when I was little. Um, the second one was – a regional down there and i finished 75th out of 200 some and was mad uh and the so happened to be the last day the boy i was traveling with casas made day three on the co-angler side so i spent the whole day three learning a different way to fish that lake um and i caught him really good that last day and i kind of was kicking myself like dang it you know but uh fast forward to what year was that uh, 20, I guess it would have been 20, yeah, 2021 last year. Um, I fished Hartwell in the spring again and finished third overall in the whole tournament. So I, I feels like this is why you're so good at gas is you've had so much training at Hartwell. Yeah. I've, I've fished Hartwell quite a bit and I truly enjoy Hartwell. Um, definitely need lives to go for that. Like, but that's, yeah, you do. Yeah. Lake Kiwi, which is up on the chain, taught me so much about Lake Anna, honestly, especially down near the dam, just the behavior, fishing deeper, that clear water. It, it, and it's crazy because, like, I, I feel like, I don't know, there's just like, because again, like, why would you say, like, Lake Anna, I would always peg as the lake that you would, that would be your lake. But then you look at your track record at Gaston, it's like, holy shit, what's the difference? And it's like, it, it's so crazy how different those lakes are from each other. They're definitely different, um, but I take Gaston as it's a Lake Anna that's a river is the best way. I love fishing rivers. I love fishing current, and Gaston has, when they're pulling water, that whole lake is current, but the structures are the exact same as Lake Anna. You got rock, you got willow grass, you got docks, you got wood, you know, laydowns and stuff. You got stump fields. You got everything that Lake Anna has, bridges, all that fun stuff, so... It's kind of like the best of both worlds in my eyes. Um, so, and then, you know, now throwing the spot of bass in there, you know, you go to the lake Hartwells and places like that, where you learn to do that kind of stuff for those species of fish. You throw all that together, it just the lake just meshes. It just, for some reason in my mind, it just clicks. Is that big enough to ever hold a bigger tournament organization, you think? Oh, the lake is definitely big enough to hold a lot bigger organization. The issue is you don't have the boat ramps. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's a shame. That really they used is to do Bassmaster out of gas, and I think they went out of like Eaton's Ferry or something. But you can't go out of Eaton's Ferry anymore. Yeah, I've always felt like Kerr and Gaston never got love that they deserve. Like, and again, James, of course, been fire the last couple of years, but I, I feel like Kerr specifically is definitely on the uptick now. Oh, big time. And then look at freaking Smith Mountain. That place is just a whole different breed. I, I, I don't understand that because, I mean, like, I truly, in my gut, think that's the lake because of the forage species where you have gizzards, the big swim bait bite too. That and they've they've shocked up fish. I think that are fourteen pounds out of there. Like I really feel like that is one of those lakes that's going to be a contender for a sixteen pounder at some point, especially with the F ones coming in. Oh yeah, and if you want to talk state record fish, I mean you got Smith, Anna, James, Chesden, Chickahominy, all in places. I mean I know. A couple of years ago, there was a regional I was in on the James, um, and the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries were out there. And I know in like a couple creeks, I'm not going to say the names so people aren't in there, you know, beating them up, but 
Um, a couple creeks, they shocked up like, I think a couple, like one or two 10 pounders and then one or two 12 pounders. And like, I know, I think last year they shocked up like a 13 and the chick, like, do you think 16 pounds would be broken out of Virginia in our lifetime? Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Probably before I turn 60 years old, it'll happen. Oh, easily. And I, I think like huge shout out to Odenkirk and, and the guys and Halliker and people at the Virginia DNR. Cause they even said it like, it's not about numbers anymore. It's about the size and kept making big fish factories. And you look at um, yeah. Occoquan Reservoir and I think it was SB that actually caught it. SB fishing. Yeah, I think it was like a 10 two or whatever that he stuck out of there this year. Like that thing was a pig. Oh yeah. Well, look at Lake Anna, you know, we'll go back to Lake Anna. Look at Lake Anna. What was it? Two, three years ago. If I remember right, I was not at the tournament. I had friends at the tournament. There was a gentleman and his grandson, I believe is the story. Um, but the, the fish was there. Like it, it, the, the story, I don't know of the people, but I know how big the fish was. They weighed in one fish that tournament and it weighed 11.02 holy shit and a two i think it was like a tuesday or friday nighter um out of sturgeon creek whatever one it was but yeah I, I, buddies of mine were there and they saw the fish like they it was 11 something it weighed on the scales like they were in the tournament now do you think at a a winter elite series event in the next five years a dirty 30 plus comes out again Havana. yeah well they had that 28 pound bag last year that broke the record um i have to believe there's enough in there for a dirty 30 i've seen 30 pounds in there i've I've fun fishing caught 30 pounds in there i don't think you're gonna see this is controversial you're you're asking me all the right questions (laughs) um but i mean it's because like the the bait is there the stocking is there it is, it is, it is. The, the gizzards are there, the LY, or not LY, the thread fin are there, the blue herring back. are there, yeah. um, you know, the bluegill and crappy populations there. Like, you've got the recipe for everything that you need in that place to do it. I just don't know if you're going to see it in the wintertime. Hmm. I think you're going to see it one of these days bed fishing where you're going to see it in that pre-spawn February time period, you know, early March time period, or like if we can get the moon and all that stuff to line up right again. And the shad spawn happens as the bass are moving up on beds, like where it's a cold, cold winter. And then all of a sudden one, two weeks of just freaking 80 degrees and everything moves up at once and wants to spawn. Like, I'll never forget it. That day I caught that giant bag fun fishing. It was literally, I seen bluegill starting to spawn. I seen bass on beds, you know, and then I had shad spawn going on and it was just ridiculous. The weights that were being caught that year. Um, so I think that year it was like all the way into June or July. You had to have like 24 freaking pounds every weekend just to win one Anna. I mean, so it sounds like you, you, you're in the boat that it will eventually give one up. It's just the time. Oh, of yeah. Year. yeah. And uh, I think I, I can see it in the winter. I can see it in January and February happening too. And just, uh, December, not so much, but I can see it in January happening again. I mean, them boys caught that 28 pound bag and I know them boys. Well, I can see them boys being the one to catch 30. Cause if I recall right, they also lost a big one that day. Um, or like Bill Deeds, uh, Bill Deeds, whenever President's Day is a couple years ago, he finished, he won the President's Day tournament that time of year and uh, with 27 something had like a three pounder that he couldn't get rid of. Imagine again, he said he had a couple big ones come off that day too. Imagine if he catches that, that one of them big ones, he's, he's got 30. I mean, it's definitely going to happen. Yeah. And I, it's so weird because I also had that thought too of like, the lake I want to see the dirty 30 come out of is probably Smith. And the reason in my thought process for that is I think Smith can take the pressure, a Lake Anna, a Chesden or a place like that. That I don't know if they can handle the pressure. And so let's say the six, a 16 pounders caught out of Chesden or 17 pounders caught out of Chesden or Lake Anna, both those places I do not think can handle any more pressure to them. Maybe Chesden a little bit more than Lake Anna, Lake Anna, definitely not, but a Smith, a, a, a Clater Lake, something off the beat like that it would just be probably better for it if it happens there. 
Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, look at what happened to, like, Briary and all them down there when that 16 was caught down on that end of the state. Like, them places got beat to live in. The, they got beat so bad there. They're not that fun to fish anymore. Now, I hear they're still great fishing. Don't, don't you know, people listening don't get that twisted. But mm. um, I hear they're not what they used to be. Now, and they weren't stocked either. Like, that's another issue, too. And I, I have to go back on my data. You know, the and this is something that you know they've even stated like you know you only have so many resources that can go around and so unless a place gets a ton of media attention james river for example you know they don't have the resources to fix every single place oh yeah and, well you you see them working really hard to fix mm -hmm. the bugs islands to fix the you know well they're, they're not really doing much with bugs that i know of other than like habitat um and gas in the same way i'm starting to see like uh there's like little square fence areas that I think they're growing some type of vegetation or something in on oh gas. Um, you know, just some other stuff. Um, and then with bugs, they, they planted all that willow grass and bugs and there's willow grass now all around bugs, the shoreline. So you're starting to see more stuff come into these. I even, I think was it this year, it was one of these years I was seeing like hydrilla and bugs um god that would change that place holy crap Yeah, like some other type of grass i don't quote me on hydrilla but something else well any if you had any submerged vegetation on, on could you imagine if you had massive grass beds on kerr like what that place would be like in 10 years oh it'd be unbelievable it'd be stupid it would be absolutely stupid i even said that about like a smith if smith had a hydrilla or or, or mill like any, it just being well you're starting to see anna with hydrilla I, I know. I don't know how they're allowed to do that. <laughs> uh, I don't think they were allowed to. I think that was that, you know, people not draining their boats properly and grass was coming into the mix. Well, good, because that will probably fix the, uh, the the algae blooms and stuff. We actually had a guy on um, in this episode. I don't know when the hell the episode's going to drop, guys. I'm so backlogged. But we had a guy on from the Shenandoah River Keepers talking about the, the state of Virginia, and this might be breaking. I don't know. That, hey, this might be breaking news. But the state is going to put, I think it's like $100,000 towards Lake Anna because of the, the algae blooms and the water quality issues. And part of that. Those places, those algae blooms are happening. I promise you, I used to fish up in those places, and they were phenomenal. And since the algae blooms, you're not catching them the way you used to up there. And I bet house money it's because there's no vegetation, whether it was the grass carp issues or whatever. You know, and, and and this is not, guys, when I say this, it's not towards fishermen because I think we get it, outdoorsmen get it. It's for the people that buy $100 million homes on the lake and just use it as a place for a week, a year. It's not a, a pool. It's a living ecosystem, and you need some of that vegetation in there to help filter and keep the water clean. Like, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yep. Um, a good place I was talking to a lot of locals, like, for example, Oneida in New York used to be awful. That place used to be watercolor was tannic colored type deal, like awful. All the vegetation came in, the dang zebra mussels or whatever, uh, whatever they're called. They came into the play and started filtering out the lake. And now the fishing, you you see it mm -hmm. like you have to catch 16, 18 pounds a day and everybody's catching them. And there's rumors gobies are getting in there, too. Like it, it's yeah, like some sometimes. Well, you know, I caught gobies when I was up there. Oh, okay, mystery solved. And there are there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, although they're 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 a hundred percent there. I was catching them. Whew. Um, bucket list item there. Yeah, I, I but they're not big yet. They're not like Erie big. They're not you know, St. Lawrence River big or anything like that. They're most of them were like that big. But, but we yeah. caught them. Yeah, give it time. Give it time. Give it time. I mean, um. Oh, what was I going to say? No. So, like, when you got stuff clearing up lakes like that, like, that's what makes the, the, the ecosystem just unbelievable. Smith Mountain's a great one because it has, it has the bait fish. It's got, you know, the deep water, the flowing water, the mountain water, the cold water. It's got everything that you can have for a body of water there, and they don't do nothing to try to affect it like whereas gaston they used to spray that grass all the time you know smith has bottom vegetation in it that sticks up like four inches but it's it's something to filter that lake um whereas now gaston you're seeing them not spray so you're starting to i, I am hoping that the education out there is starting to tilt where people realize the importance of aquatic vegetation and to where you're going to start seeing 
maybe it not being sprayed as bad because because again it's it's homeowners associations it's all that money yeah. like once they start understanding like this is important i think that's going to be a huge kick in the right direction for all of our fisheries most, most definitely i mean tra- travis we covered a lot of things here uh definitely what i mean you got any new sponsors that that is on the docket now for 2023 yeah, Vexen. Vexen Fishing, man. They make great crankbaits. They make great frogs. They make great rods. I've been throwing a lot of their rods now, and I am very pleased with a lot of their rods. Um, they, uh, they, they, you know, they make walleye stuff for the walleye fishermen out there. The guys that up north that want to ice fish, they got stuff for that. They got, man, I did a post on Facebook the other day. Um, you'll have to check it out. You know, it's there's a carry bag like for co-anglers or people fishing ponds or stuff like that that you can fit like five or six little kits into it and it's got storage for all your plastic sunglasses whatever it's a great backpack that you can just carry around um so they're they've been you know i've been working with them and they're they've a great company great people to work with and they're quick about their business and they want to get you what you want Good deal, dude. Yeah, and again, guys, link in the episode description to all of Travis's social media, and of course, I will link his sponsors there as well, so you can do, so you can build a shop and also follow this man on his journey. Uh, try. I mean, is there anything else that you want to touch on, or, or we forgot to talk? Um, about? Oh, we'll, we'll continue. Uh, I do have a couple other sponsors I want to thank, like Crown Batteries. Man, I've been running Crown Batteries now for shoot five, five years, five, six years now, something like that, and. I've never had an issue with their batteries. They, dude, I can go days on the water without charging and just be ready to keep going. Um, so I, I do enjoy the batteries. They're out of Ohio. They're a great company. You can look them up, get batteries from them. Um, and then Jake's Bait and Tackle, I want to thank them and you for everything y'all have done for me as well. Now, well, I'm here to help you in any way I can, whether it's meeting you at, you know, whatever time to give you a GoPro or to have you on the show, whatever I can do to help you out, dude. Yeah, and we need to get on the water soon. Yes, yes. Once once things get uh yeah, yeah. We'll get yeah. there eventually. <laughs> oh yeah. Even if we gotta use your boat, man, we just come on down. I can get you. We can go do that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a plan. Guys, you know, conversation ends here. Uh we might be talking a little bit longer, but uh please like subscribe to the channel. We are the fastest growing outdoor uh fishing show in the greater DC metropolitan area. We'll see you next time, fishing the D. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Aarons. And Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.